the Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, FIL Responsible Entity Australia Limited, AFSL 409 340, ABN 33148 059 009 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hello everyone, Jamie McIntyre here. This ensemble series is all about the great wealth transfer. Throughout this series, you'll get insights from planners in our community and the team at Fidelity who have produced significant research on the great wealth transfer. I'm sure you will enjoy this series and get a greater understanding of how you can help in the great wealth transfer. Fidelity has been investing globally for their clients for more than 50 years and 20 years here in Australia. With one of the world's largest investment research teams, they conduct more than 20,000 company meetings each year to uncover unique investment insights that others may miss. Fidelity offers a range of Australian, global and regional managed funds and you can also access their investment expertise through our active ETFs on the ASX. Invest with local insights, powered by global strength. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode two of our podcast series. My name is Jamie McIntyre, and I'm the host of today's podcast. In our podcast today, we are going to discuss the growing phenomenon of living legacies. We will chat with Lucas from Fidelity about the research that has been conducted by them, and we will also chat with Rob Danielle, our guest planner, from the planner's experience point of view. Our first guest today from Fidelity is Lucas de Pourbet. Lucas is the Global Cross Asset Specialist with Fidelity International. Lucas is a wealth management executive with a passion for helping clients achieve their goals. He has extensive experience in business strategy, investment management, investment consulting, and product research. Lucas will today share with us insights from the research that Fidelity have been doing around the great wealth transfer happening now in Australia. Welcome to the podcast, Lucas. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for having me. Great to have you. Our next guest is our planner guest, and that's Rob Daniele. Rob has been in the financial planning profession for seven years, spending his first two years as a graduate with the bank and subsequently three years planning with that bank. The following two years, he has spent with a small practice with a focus on pre-retirees, and he has just established his own practice, also with a focus on pre- and post-retirees. His sweet spot when giving advice is to people who qualify for a part Centrelink age pension. Welcome to the podcast, Rob. Uh, thanks for having me, Jamie. Uh, great to have you here. Looking forward to asking you both plenty of questions today, but let's kick off with you, Lucas. Lucas, what does the research tell us about the wealth being transferred and whilst people are still alive rather than by their estate? Yeah, it's quite interesting. I mean, the research shows that uh, we've got approximately $3.5 trillion passing uh, to the next generation this decade. So it's a, it's a fairly large number. And one of the interesting trends that we've been observing is that more and more people are, are looking to transfer the, their wealth before they, they pass away. Um, and, and the statistics show that it's about one in four, one in four people uh, are looking to transfer wealth before they die, um, which is, again, a, a growing trend. And look, fundamentally, um, the reason why we're seeing this is that people want to provide, um, you know, greater financial security to their, to their kids. Um, we all know, um, obviously, the, 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 you know, house prices, all of these sort of things that, you know, the, the, the children are impacted by. And so therefore, we are seeing a, a growing trend in terms of transferring uh, uh, wealth before uh, before people pass away. Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely something that I'm experiencing as a planner. And I, and I know Rob is. Um, and, and Rob, we're here to talk to you and ask you from the mm. planner's experience. I'll share some of mine along the way as well. But what's your experience been with gifting or giving by clients to their children whilst they're still, still alive? Yeah, sure. So it is coming up quite a bit and you're talking about it almost every sort of meeting now with, you know, 
clients, their kids, you know, when I'm saying clients, they're generally over the age of 60 or retired. And um, yeah, a lot of mine are receiving that part age pension and their kids are, um, you know, looking to buy their first house. They might be in their thirties, getting married. Um, and yeah, sometimes I guess at that stage, we're not really talking about schooling just yet because generally my kids and my clients are just getting married, buying their first house in their thirties. Um, so education for their grandkids is a bit down the track still. Um, but yeah, there's a, I guess a lot of roadblocks that, um, come in the way, you know, what's the impact from a Centrelink perspective regarding, you know, if they give money. How is Centrelink going to treat that? You know, there's also other things as well, which um, more of a qualitative sort of scenario where people are looking at, you know, family dynamics. And maybe I find it a lot with um, clients with multiple kids. It's a lot more on the back burner, the gifting sort of scenario, because it's just hard to approach sometimes because you might have one child that's still studying or one child that's in a professional career and they're just renting, no family, no kids, no plans for that. And then you've got the other one that's saying, hey, mum and dad, can I have some money to buy a house um, to sort of settle down in? And then it's, yeah, it makes it hard from, I guess, the parents' point of view. They're a lot more inclined to give money for a home, you know, let's say pull a number of 50 grand for a home. Versus, you know, they still want to help out the other child, but they might be financially okay. And then it's just sort of giving 50 grand to, to them to buy a car. So yeah, um, it's, yeah, I guess like, um, clients that have just one child, I see, you know, from my experience, I see a lot more gifts flowing through to that single child versus, um, yeah, uh, families with multiple children. So yeah, and I think I think you're right there, Rob. That's uh, it's the easy answer when it's only one child because the family dynamics are pretty straightforward, right? And yeah, once multiple children come into play, there's there's different needs, different requirements, different stages of life, um, and and parents are always trying to uh, well make it fair. And what is fair? Um, yeah. So. So it does make it complicated, doesn't it? No, uh, definitely. And it's, um, yeah, just a matter of working through with clients, you know, what the repercussions are of doing so. But yeah, it's hard to sort of, it's a bit of a taboo topic sometimes when there's multiple kids and sometimes it just gets swept under a rug. Um, things like weddings, where they might be helping out with that, it's a little bit easier to, you know, it might be a 10, 20 grand gift for a wedding and that might be a bit easier, but yeah, sometimes it just gets swept under the rug and then years go by and, you know, their kids still aren't in the housing market because they haven't given them a gift and then it's, we need to give more now to give them what a deposit's worth. So yeah, it's just the sort of um, snowball effect from there. It's actually, yeah. it's actually an interesting one, just those, you know, it actually does come out in the research as well um, to, to to Robert's point in the, the, the whole sort of one of the big, topics or concerns is that whole managing family dynamics um and then if you if you do decide to you know uh, provide some money for whatever it's like you know what is the most you know m most sort of uh democratic impactful impactful, impactful way so yeah. I, I think with the, the the sort of research shows that you know in most instances a lot of people just opt for equal distribution about 40 percent of people say well that's <laughs> that's the way we'll do it uh, the other one, which sort of makes a lot of sense, is just open communication discussion, and about twenty nine percent of people say that's sort of the way they manage that issue of, of fairness and uh, uh, equity and, and and so forth. Yeah, I think cultural is an interesting one. I, I suppose I mean I live in Geelong. There's a subculture in Geelong of people in Geelong and what they do. Um, there's so many different cultures around, well, around the world really, and um, there's different different views from different cultures. Um, look, talking maybe circling back to the Centrelink conversation, you know, you're talking about pensioners and maybe a bit of the culture of those that receive a part pension. There's a there's a culture around that too, right, Rob? There's, there's yeah. those that haven't been in the superannuation system, I suppose, for long enough. And there's a bit of a culture they want to protect that age pension. So it's really about identifying with them 
how much money they can afford to give rather than what the impact is on their pension moving forward. Yeah, definitely. We see that, like I was, you know, saying that a lot of them just anchor to that, you know, back to the gifting rules. How much can you actually gift without it impacting your pension, i.e. $10,000 a year and a maximum of, you know, $30,000 in a five-year period. So, you know, that $10,000 number really comes up quite a bit. And a lot of the, you know, part age pensioners, they just anchor to that because they've, you know, worked their whole life to get some sort of entitlement and they don't want to lose that entitlement. And they just revert back to the easy number of 10,000. And sometimes you have in conversations with clients and they say, um, I say, you know, you can give them a hundred grand if you want. And it's, you know, a look of shock on their face. Like, oh, really? I thought we're only allowed to give 10,000. Well, you can give as much as you want. It's just what the Centrelink impact is going to be on that. So whereas, yeah, it's a bit of, I don't know, Chinese whispers um, around the whole Centrelink gifting rules. People think, you know, there might be a tax implication for gifting. There is, you can only legally gift a certain amount, whereas it's really, you can give as much as you want. It's just, what's the Centrelink impact and are you okay um, with that. And I thought, um, we had a chat earlier as well, last time, Jamie, and you mentioned as well, the, um, you know, yes, we can give more and what's the opportunity cost or of doing that. And are they okay with it? So, you know, I crunch some numbers and let's say some client wants to give $60,000 to their child. That's $50,000, um, will still be assessed for the next five years from Centrelink. And, you know, if a couple that owns their own home, that's about a $3,900 a year um, detriment to their age pension for the next five years versus, you know, $50,000 times, you know, 6% interest that the child might have to pay on their loans, easy three grand a year there, not even taking into account the principal on that. So, I think, yeah, it's probably about just trying to educate clients a little bit more about that. And maybe they, um, you know, give that money to their kids and say, oh, look, we're losing this age pension. This will help you get into the housing market. And hey, can you give us, you know, a couple grand a year as interest slash what we're losing on the age pension? Then it's sort of everyone wins from there because, yeah. Yeah, I think I think to sum that up in some ways, you you're having a broader discussion about um, family wealth and and the and the broader aspects of not just the narrowness of the Centrelink or the age pension, a small amount being lost. And you also mentioned Chinese whispers. I, I think they all sit around with their friends and their friends explain things to them about the age pension or gifting and what it actually means to the person giving the information. Um, yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly a lot of Chinese whispers around that. Um, but those family dynamics are always tricky to navigate, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. So I think it's just about educating them, explaining to them, and yeah, if they're comfortable with that, and you know, the opportunity cost of giving that money away, then you know, I think if we have a lot more, you know, even myself, if I um, speaking to a client, just educate them a little bit more about that. It'll make them feel a lot more comfortable. Um, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I suppose what are, what are some of the strategies that that you've deployed? Maybe we'll talk more about the receiver. Um, what are some of the strategies you talked about? Talk to the people who are the receivers of money, um, and the things that they need to consider for themselves along the journey of the wealth transfer. Yeah, so I guess a lot of my conversations are probably more with the um, the clients who are retired giving the money, and I'm not usually talking to that receiver of the wealth. Generally, it's them and um, like a life change initiating it, whether that be marriage or buying the home, and them initiating asking their parents or their parents can see them going through these life changes and. The parents saying, yep, we want to help them out with that type of thing. So, yeah, generally I'm not talking too much around the – to the receiving party of the funds. So, yeah. Yeah, that's more to do with that space that you're working in currently. Mm, yeah, that's look, right. Look, look, we've had some experience with a potential receiver. Uh, she has a, 
father, her father's 93 years old and her father owns 50% of her house uh, and she owns 50%. She's on disability support pension. Right. So, so there's, it's, we've just met with this lady recently. She's in her late fifties, early sixties. And um, for her, it's really important for her to figure out how she's going to receive the estate. Um, she has a disability support pension. She doesn't want to risk losing that, which disability support is measured fairly similarly to the age pension. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the receivers need to have a good understanding of what's potentially coming as well, don't they? Yeah, definitely. Otherwise, you know, that could significantly impact, you know, her pension, which is obviously quite important to her. Um, and yeah, potentially other sort of consequences that you're not, that's not there on face value. So yeah, now that you did mention it, I did have a client, they really sort of had it set up and got legal advice, um, around it. So the clients, um, in her early sixties and, um, wanted to purchase a home with the daughter and they got legal advice around it, which was quite sound just to make sure that when the um when she does go to the age pension eventually that it's not sit considered a gift she's still going to be considered she paid fair consideration such that she's a homeowner as well for Centrelink um so you know and they just living in a sharing shared sort of scenario um but Centrelink still look at her as a homeowner um because she did it properly from when she got it set up. Whereas if she didn't do it properly, maybe, you know, uh, purchase not at market value or gave more money, you know, to purchase the house and took less equity, Centrelink would have potentially considered that as a gift and, um, yeah, it could have impacted her. But And some people, yeah, if they don't get advice, they do these things and then go, you know, oh, crap, when the time comes because it, the problem might not be there immediately, but it's not until they go apply for Centrelink or something happens later down the track, um, you know, in your scenario, Jane, with a will in the event that client passes away. So a lot of these problems, um, yeah, they might not recognize them straight away, but they'll find out eventually if they don't get the correct advice. So from setting it up. Yeah, I think that's what this research helps us with, Lucas, is helps us to understand that people are wanting to do this. And I, I for me, and I think we've all known being in the financial services profession or the industry yourself, Lucas, that there's so much untapped advice um, no, and this. We're, we're, we're potentially not asking the right questions or getting the right messages out. And that's where this this research is really helpful for us as advisors, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's interesting just listening to the conversation there. And obviously, there's you know something that sounds relatively simple. There's a there's a there's a range of complexities that come with 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 some of these decisions. And you know what the research. One of the interesting things is is um, you know in terms of the receivers, wh- where do they get their advice? Um, I mean, the research shows that you know roughly sort of thirty five percent do do seek professional financial uh, uh, advice, uh, but Outside of that, you know, people are relying on 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 their own existing knowledge, on you know, family uh, members, um, accountant, and you know, a whole variety of sources. So, it does seem like it's uh, it's you know the the need for advice in this area. There's 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 certainly a, a need, uh, and people are seeking it out, albeit still sort of only thirty five percent. Yeah, and I I think that's where planners are really well placed. Uh, planners such as myself and Rob. Um, look, oh, there, there are people that will give advice freely, be it family or friends, but, mm. but generally speaking, they're coming from a place of vested interest, generally speaking. Um, and, and, you know, it's where the planners are really well placed through what we do. And you could even say around regulations that have, have encouraged that is to, is to act in their best interest. So we're looking from their lens and we can mm-hmm. dig deeper into that, Rob, can't we? And, and, and help them navigate these things to make good financial decisions. Yeah. And I think when, you know, the 65% of people that aren't getting advice, seek advice from family and friends. I mean, everyone means well when they're giving advice, but, um, you know, disability support pension, prior to age, pension age has different set of, you know, 
sort of consequences and tax outcomes to after. And there's all these sort of ins and outs that the family or friends might not know. They're trying to do the right thing, but sometimes, you know, you just don't know what you don't know. And them trying to do the right thing could end up in, um, you know, some significant consequences. And especially when we're talking about property and how that's purchased and gifted, um, it's very messy, complicated and expensive to unwind mistakes as well. So, you know, once it's set up, it's, yeah, very, very complicated to unwind a mistake. Yeah, the advantage of um, getting advice early. Mm. And and Rob, tell me around some of the work you're doing with your clients who, who are more the givers. Um, what, what type of things do you work through with them to help them, well, figure this this stuff out, right? Do you work through with them to demonstrate their longevity of savings so they have a good knowledge of what they're able to gift? Um, is that is that a, that a part that you work on? Yeah, so it's really just looking at where they are now, where they want to be. So if I'm meeting a client for the first time, it's um, it's talking about their goals regarding retirement, their income needs, their capital needs moving forward, and then also looking at the estate planning side um, with the kids and, you know, going through the family tree, um, working out the wheels, where's the flow of the money going to, are there any tax minimization strategies there? And also just asking the questions. So, um, you know, I treat it almost like if someone wants to buy a car worth 50 grand in five years, I'll incorporate that in their plan, in their financial modeling and show them the impact. And the same goes for the gifting side of things. So, um, you know, they, uh, when I'm speaking to clients, their kids might not be married now, but have partners, might not have homes now. And I'm saying, you know, what's the plan for your kids? Do you know their plans? And how would that impact you as well? Um, and it can be all, yeah, different types of scenarios. I think it's really important to know the finance, um, the family's dynamics as well. Um, when you're going through these, you know, scenarios, like I had a client recently that um, sold their place and moved in with their child and helped out a little bit like that way, and then bought a property, their sort of end goal retirement home. So knowing the family dynamics, I knew what was coming before it happened because that let me know their plans. So, um, and yeah, I'll take that into account when I'm providing financial projections, just those and then it's up to the client what they want to do. When they see it on paper, they know the impact it's going to have to them. And if they can afford it, they can afford it. And if they can't, well, they might still do it. And they just got to be comfortable on how that impacts their longevity of their funds, which sometimes they are. So, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and there's there's plenty of parents that are willing to forego something in the future for themselves to give something to their children, and and this is where we talk about that word living living legacy, isn't it? And you're giving something with a, a warm hand rather than a cold heart um, when you die. And I've had experience as well with many clients who are prepared to affect the longevity of their retirement assets, uh, so they can. I suppose, see the smile on their children's face whilst they're alive. Well, part of the research that we've read through Fidelity, there's also a nest egg mentality of those that are trying to protect their nest egg. What's your What's your experience with that? Yeah, so I think um, what you mean by that question, Jamie, that, you know, they've worked their whole lives, um, they've got their money in superannuation, it's their money, it's for retirement, it's for fun, it's for living on, and they don't want to give it away. Is that where you're sort of alluding to with yeah. that question? Yeah. And it does, clients and their, they've got their reasons why they want to protect it. Sometimes it's, you know, they've worked hard, they want to keep these funds. Other times they're concerned as well about giving funds and where those funds might end up um, to kids for, you know, potential divorces down the track and so forth. So they're worried about, you know, letting that money go. And obviously if they seek advice around it, there's ways to structure things. But also around the health side of things, um, clients uh, want to make sure that they're looked after. Um, there's costs that might prop up in the future of aged care. 
Um, you know, I've had one client that was spending 50 grand a year on um, experimental cancer treatment. So, you know, that wasn't covered under the uh, pharmaceutical benefit scheme. So I think clients have these things in the back of their head where they want to make sure that they're still going to be looked after because they might have enough money as it is. But if you're spending 50 grand a year on experimental cancer drugs, that could chew up your wealth pretty quick and not, you know, tap into your nest egg and um, not give you enough funds to be able to gift away and things like that. So I think access to capital is really big for um, clients, you know, even when I'm talking about annuities, sometimes the clients where it involves locking a portion away of your money up and some of these annuities, they still have access to if they want. Um, and it's also got some death benefits attached, but they, you know, they've worked their whole lives. They really don't want to let these funds go and they really want to get age pension is a lot of what my, uh, I see in my clients. So yeah, some of them just don't yeah, want to give money. So I don't know if there's any statistics about percentages, maybe Lucas, yeah. that they want to give. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's an interesting one. I think that the, 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 the sort of um, research so shows that look, the majority of people recognize that the nest egg's there to be spent, but I guess where, where the, where the nuance comes in is, is around the confidence around how much money do they actually need, and I think that's where, where, where you get that hesitancy. Um, so in, the research sort of shows that sort of one in seven, um, only around one in seven people are actually confident that their retirement savings will be sufficient to support their desired lifestyle. So it sort of signals to me that again, um, that lack of clarity as to how much they actually need. Um, that's that's a real sort of interesting angle then from an advice perspective in terms of mapping that out and um, and I think what causes some of that confusion is there's a lot of numbers thrown out in terms of this is how much you need in retirement and and so that that can impact then um, how people behave yeah where they're getting their sources of information from yeah, yeah when they say you need a million dollars to retire and if they don't have that million then don't want to gift any away because they don't yeah. have that million <laughs> yeah. And it creates a perception that they need to hang on to that million as well, doesn't yeah. it? You know, like just live off the interest. That's that's also a, a common thing. You can see that in some cultures as well. Mm. Yeah, no, definitely. They, they yeah, um, uh, I've even yeah got a client and he's they they really don't spend a whole lot of money, and he keeps telling me. Um, I've had him for yeah over five years, and he keeps telling me how happy he is that he's had the same amount of money when he saw me that he started with. And I'm like, you know, that's great and all, but you're also five years older. You're, you know, just just spend it, just go for it. And I keep, yeah, tell him, but they, he keeps a spreadsheet and just anchors to that, um, you know, that um, initial amount of money. And he's not um, aggressive or not aggressive, but he never complains about returns when it goes up and down or, whatnot he's just you know happy when time goes on and if he's got the same amount that he started so um which yeah i try to educate and coach them as much as they um as much as i can but sometimes they've just got that sort of cultural mentality where they've just you know put away all their eggs for retirement and just want to keep them there as well and um i try and educate them and tell them to spend it and yeah sometimes people are stuck in their ways with their spending habits and that can be a good thing for them as well so they don't blow all their money yeah they they've experienced that working well for them for most of their lives and and i think you use the word they, they get anchored to it don't they yeah does, does does that client have children that you know, we need to have a living legacy conversation about rob yeah oh uh, look it's interesting you brought that because the the kids of this child they yeah don't have any sort of um yeah uh, family that they're older in their 40s don't plan to have families they're both single the two kids and they don't really need any help from their their parents so their parents just want to make sure that they're looked after um which are my clients and um yeah they're not sort of looking at gifting any funds or um that type of thing so yeah everyone's a little different yeah definitely so rob in your seven-year journey uh you've had some experience now with with living legacies with clients 
and you've and you've done it to a level where you've communicated with your client and and not necessarily the children. What's the next steps in you taking advantage for your clients and with your clients and 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 making their lives better with living living legacies? What's the next step for you in 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 growing in this area and um, and making sure you help even more than you already do? Yeah, definitely. I think. Um... Yeah, that's probably the next step in terms of bringing the kids into the meeting and getting everyone on the same page. I have thought about it. And if you could line up both the kids in the meeting with the parents and the parents wanted to give funds, um, sometimes the kids also um, just rewinding, they don't want to receive a gift sometimes because they're worried about, oh, are my mum and dad going to have enough money? Um, to live on so they're a bit hesitant sometimes obviously they want the money but they're like oh crap am I going to then have to look after my parents because they've given me money so I think um, that could be something I could look to in the future for my clients and hold them all in the same room and say um, to my clients who are the parents of the kids and say to the kids look this is the plan I've done for your parents they've allocated gifts along the track you can see that they still have enough funds to live on. So we're all sort of happy days. And your brother's getting the same amount as your sister. This is, you know, all on the table here. This is what it looks like. And I think, yeah, it's easier said than done because it's hard to, yeah, I don't know about your experience, Jane, with nailing down the kids for questions or getting them all together. You see that um, have busy lives and whatnot. But I think that could be very impactful having them all together and saying, look, your parents are okay if they give you the money and they're giving each kid the same amount of money. So take it and use it and yeah, happy days. Yeah, I think our major role as financial planners is to help people make better decisions with money. Um, And yeah, at times it is well, it's difficult to bring family units together, but it's, it's going to be so important moving forward with um, well, in this report, it's three point five trillion. I, I think I saw some more information out on it the other day, Lucas, that is estimating at four point nine trillion, which is probably reasonable as well, um, with the way property prices and the share market's going currently. Um, yeah, I think it's really important that we do lean further into this, Rob, and and work really hard to bring these units together because we're so well placed to help them, aren't we? Yeah, we've got that whole sort of picture um, and snapshot of everything. Um, You know, we know sometimes, yeah, if they go see a, I refer them on to a solicitor, the solicitor is asking me questions about their family dynamics because we've known them for so many years and they would just seen them for an hour appointment to draw up the wheels where I really know, you know, all their details of where they want to go and, um, you know, who they want their funds to eventually go to and why and that type of thing. Yeah, and I, we have such great knowledge on, and because of the way we're trained and the way we've trained ourselves is uh, we care and we dig pretty deep and we understand clients at a pretty deep level. We're so well positioned to help clients in this space for, for them to get great value out of this and, and there's value in it for the financial planners as well. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, look at the research to to your point, Jamie. It's just, I mean, from a from a planning perspective, and this is just going to be an increasingly growing area. Um, and outside of the sort of, I guess, hard statistical and advice sort of areas, but those sort of softer things around um, communication that both you know, Rob and yourself have mentioned. Um, that the research does clearly point to that. That's an area that that that. Outside of the numbers, it's it's what concerns a lot of um, a lot of people is how they're going to manage that whole transferring, you know, making sure everyone's expectations are sort of aligned, and uh, and all those sort of things. Yep, I agree with that totally. I, I think what we've in our discussions today, Rob, um, in your journey as a seven year planner, you've built to a, a position now, and. Um, and there's a great opportunity there for you and for me and for all planners to uh, increase their skills in this area, make sure their client value proposition can support um, this type of work. And uh, I think it's potentially going to keep us all pretty busy for a long time to come, isn't it? 
Yeah, that's it. It's always a moving, um, moving beast, as we know. And there's all these sort of changes, and a lot of the you know retirees that we're dealing with, uh, just sort of some of them are getting wealthier with the sort of the whole property side of things. And sometimes you know, especially over the last years, it just keeps going up, up, up. So sometimes conversations might not have happened a few years ago, but now all of a sudden they're in a $1.8 million home that they're happy to downsize to a million dollar home and free up all this money in their mid seventies that they're not going to need. So I think, you know, as time goes on, it's just going to be more and more. Yeah. Clients are going to come to us more with all these sort of questions. Well, and the regulatory settings are doing their best to push them out of those uh, big homes as well. So, you know, that's freeing up money for, for either giving with the living legacy or uh, or strengthening up their own position. Mm. Rob, thank you for your time today and your contribution to our podcast from Planners Lens. Um, I think you've given all the planners that listen some really good insights into what you do. And, um, and thanks for being on today. Yeah, no, uh, thanks for uh, having me, Jamie. And Lucas, uh, thanks to the team at Fidelity for investing in this research. It certainly gives us uh, a lot of great information, a lot of great data, and um, plenty to think about about how we can all position our businesses and really position ourselves to be able to help more people in this area as, as money changes hands. Thanks for having me, Jamie. My pleasure.